Dr. Hansen, uh, congratulations for receiving the Blue Planet Prize. Uh, I would like to ask you how you became interested in science. For me, when I was in school, in high school, and I found mathematics and physics to be the easiest subjects for me. So naturally, when I went to the university, I took courses, and I was very lucky because the university I was at was the physics department was chaired by Professor Van Allen, who had very recently put a satellite around the Earth yeah. and discovered the radiation belts. But he was a great man, and he was a great teacher. And it was a very uh, exciting research environment. And so naturally, I was drawn into that. How you uh, became interested in the climate change issues uh, in your academic career? I started out in planetary research because at the university I had worked on trying to understand why Venus was so hot and I wrote my PhD thesis on that. And then I became very interested in Venus and I wanted to know what are the clouds of Venus, what are they made of. So I spent years um, studying the observations of Venus and then proposing an experiment to go to Venus and measure the cloud properties. And that experiment was selected by NASA but it took five years for us to build the instrument. And during that time, I was asked by a postdoctoral student at Harvard University if I would help him make calculations for the effect of greenhouse gases on the Earth's temperature. And we did that. We wrote a paper. And uh, I realized then that the Earth was more interesting than Venus mm -hmm. because the Earth's changing before our eyes, and it's going to have, it could have important effects uh, during our lifetimes and certainly during our children's lifetimes. So I, I ended up resigning as the principal investigator on the Venus experiment, and one of my friends took that over. And then ever since then, I've been working on trying to understand the Earth's climate. And one of the very important uh, work that you have done and the climate change research is that uh, you, uh, at the Congress uh, in 1988, uh, gave uh, the evidence. And this gave us a very uh, impressive uh, influence to the, not only to the Congress people, but also the general public. So since then, in the last 20 years, how do you think about the change in the perception of the climate change? Well, I think in 1988 when I testified, I think most scientists probably agreed that the evidence was beginning to appear that humans were affecting the climate. But it, scientists by nature tend to be very cautious and um, we're not ready to make a strong statement. But the difficulty with this uh, issue is that if you wait too long, mm. then there are many effects that will be in the pipeline, and then it's impossible to avoid the consequences. So we really have to try to identify what's happening as early as we can. Particularly difficult because of the economic implications of trying to um, reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So this becomes a very complex problem in many different ways. Uh, you have been using very often the term tipping point. Yeah. And so this tipping point seems to be quite important, uh, even in the discussion in biodiversity. Uh, this year, uh, in May, uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook 3 was released. And then they first used the tipping point for even for biodiversity. So could you explain a little bit about the importance of uh, this concept and how we could utilize uh, this concept uh, for move forward? Yeah, I think there are a number of different problems where, which are nonlinear, mm -hmm. where the changes initially are small, but once they begin to reach a certain point, then the dynamics of the system can take over and you get larger changes even without any additional uh, forcing to the system. And 
the simple example is ice sheets because you can easily imagine once an ice sheet begins to collapse, then there's nothing you can do to stop it. But likewise with biodiversity, I actually like to call it extermination of species because that's a more blunt way of saying what we're doing. If we destroy some species, then because they depend upon each other, it can begin to snowball and you can have ecosystems collapse and then you lose many species. So again, that's a nonlinear problem where you don't want to pass a certain point because then the dynamics can take over. Uh, very recently, you wrote a book, Storms of My Grandchildren. And in your lecture, you also mentioned about uh, your grandchildren. So what is your motivation of writing this book? A primary feature about climate change is the fact that the system, the climate system has inertia. So we don't see most of the effect until some time passes. It takes several decades because the ocean is deep. It takes it a long time to warm up in response to the changes in the atmosphere. So that makes it the potential for intergenerational injustice where we burn the fossil fuels and then our children and grandchildren and further generations will suffer the consequences. Um, it's, uh, well, as you get older you start to think about uh, young people and what you're leaving for them. Uh, could you give us your message to the scientists? Uh, you say uh, sometimes uh, this is not uh, just a scientific issues, but it's a moral issue. So how about the scientists, the law? Well, I mean, it is clear it is a moral issue. Uh, part of it is related to the intergenerational um, injustice of climate change. Uh, but also, you know, the other species on the planet. The one species, humans, should not be destroying the other species on the planet. Um, and ag again, it's easy to understand how young people, uh, young professionals, may not want to um, destroy their career by beginning to get as active as I have. So I think perhaps us older scientists have a responsibility to try to make some of these issues clearer. How do you think about the communication between the scientists and the policy makers for solving of climate change issues? Well, I think scientists should not be afraid to point out the policy implications of the science. Otherwise, it's too easy for policymakers to say some words, reassuring words, but not take the actions that are needed. I think, I think that scientists are particularly well trained to make, connect the dots and uh, analyze the problem and uh, not necessarily take the easy way out. We have to, we have to make clear the truth, not just the science, but what actions are needed in order to, uh, to solve problems where they exist. My last question is about uh, UNU, United Nations University. You are aware of uh, this university's activities and uh, you already came to uh, our university several times. And so uh, what do you think about the role of UNU for solving of climate change? Well, what has become clear is that these are global issues, and there are issues of inter-nation uh, justice also. Uh, so I think it's very important that we have places where the diff people from different countries can get together and understand each other and understand what's needed to deal with the issues. So I think uh, it's a unique uh, organization and can play an important role. Thank you very much once again and congratulations. Thank you.